This week, first up, we welcome back Peter Smith, the founder and CEO of Edgewise, for an interview. Talk a little bit about Linux malware uh, and how some of the zero trust protections uh, can be applied to that platform as well, of course. In our second segment, we welcome back Kevin Finisterre and we welcome Josh Valentine to talk about their project, Arcade Hustle, and all things arcade hacking and the arcade scene, mm -hmm. which I'm learning share more and more lineage in history with computer hacking. In the security news, who is responsible for Active Directory security within your organization? Apple publishes new technical details on their privacy features. How to ensure online safety with DNS over HTTPS is, is there. And just to annoy Joff, I added that story. And Amazon's Ring video doorbell could open the door of your home to hackers or not. But stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Qualys is introducing a new prescription for security, and it's free. Global IT Asset Discovery and Inventory. Activated today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys so you can achieve 100% near real-time visibility across your hybrid environments. And welcome to the show! And just for Johnny... So, you want to fight? Fight me! But first, let me introduce you to the show and our host, Mr. Paul Asadorian, who doesn't have lag. Welcome, oh. everyone, to Paul. You all right over yeah. there, Larry? <laughs> Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 626, recorded on November 7th, 2019. We are here, and at least Larry and I are here at G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Larry, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's been a couple weeks. Yeah, it's good to have yeah, you back. Yeah, yeah. The last time, last time, last show I missed, uh, I was exactly halfway around the world. Right. Yeah, and now fun. you're back, which it's is good. good. On the lines, remotely from an undisclosed location, where his video is a little fuzzy. Mr. Tyler Robinson is here. Tyler, welcome. Or it, it's like it waited until the moment where I introduced Tyler on the show to have all kinds of latency with his connection. It's like it knows what. It's good. All right, we'll come back to Tyler, uh, it, who looks good. With, he's got a tie on and everything. Mr. Joff Thire is here with us. Joff, on the lines remotely anyway, with us. Joff, <laughs> welcome. Well, I'm, I'm with you in spirit. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. It's so great to be here. It's been a couple of weeks. I have missed everybody, of course. And uh, yes, the, uh, we do have a little bit of uh, vid lag, but uh, we'll live. Uh, we're going to work our way through it. Push through it. Push through it. Um, let's see. There is an announcement. Yes, we have exciting news about the Security Weekly webcast program. Of course, we're partnering with ISC Squared as an official CPE provider. If you attend any of our webcasts, you get one CPE credit per webcast. Upcoming ones are with ServiceNow, Greathorn, and Core Security. You can register for those at securityweekly.com. Click the drop-down menu. You can register for the upcoming ones or tune into our on-demand library, and you still get one CPE credit per 
uh, webcast. Is Tyler? Tyler's back. He looks like a lot. The video looks a lot clearer. Or not? Okay. Well, uh, well. When is this? Oh. <laughs> hey, Tyler. Are you back? Are you there? Yay. Uh, I'm here. Okay, good. I think that's the not the right language for where I'm at, but yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. It is. It is not. But uh, you know, you're broadcasting live from the sauna, so it's yeah. all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no habla español. Parlez-vous français? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Smith <laughs> is here with us this evening on the lines remotely. He's the founder and CEO of Edgewise, sporting his Steve Jobs inspired turtleneck. Uh, <laughs> I tried. That's Patagonia. Hey, thanks for having me. Sorry, I couldn't be there. It's okay. It's nice to uh, to have you on the show, Peter. Um, and I'm excited to talk about uh, the topic that you were just briefing us on a moment ago. And, and Tyler. It's the first time Tyler and Peter are on the show together. In the exchange between them before the show, I was like, "Ah, oh, this is gonna be." I could see the gears just turning. It was very, it was very nerdy. Peter, you are a very nerdy CEO, which I wouldn't have it any other way. So, uh, why don't you set the stage for us and some of the uh, things that you've been working on recently? Oh, sure. So uh, we've been working with a lot of financial services institutions uh, that are focused on their Linux infrastructure in particular. Um, our solution obviously works on Windows and Linux, but uh, the reason they're focused on this is because they're finding that the Linux infrastructure lacks some of the uh, capabilities that they find commonly on Windows. So uh, a good example of that would be uh, application whitelisting. And uh, which is really popular in financial services. Uh, and so what they've been looking at on the Linux side is alternatives like SE Linux. And let's just say some of them are struggling with implementing SE Linux. And uh, that's probably because it's built by the DOD for the DOD. And unless you've got a true army of people, you're not gonna truly wrap your head, head around it. Um, so what we've been doing is showing them that a zero trust model can actually be an effective mitigation strategy against uh, propagation of malware in Linux environments. And that's what we're going to focus on today. It's awesome. Um, are, are there, the, what are some of the capabilities inside of SE Linux that, in your opinion, are most valuable, but also present kind of that challenge, Peter, where they're really hard to configure and get right, especially at scale, right? Yeah. Um, SE Linux can be used to do traditional application control, but in most environments, execution is not the thing that's being controlled by SE Linux. It's really viewed as a mandatory access control model that controls exactly what files and services and network connectivity a given process is able to have. And one of the reasons it's not quite as common as an execution prevention tool is because of the nature of Linux. So uh, let's take a, a simple scenario. Like I have to do basic administration that requires me to use the uh, a core set of 15 Linux commands. I use them in scripts. I use them sort of day to day. Um, those happen to be the same administrative commands that are often used by attackers right. for living off the land attacks. So if you take away access to them from an execution perspective, you're taking away both the administrative capability as well as the threat vector. So instead, the SE Linux model is more focused on what is the set of things, files, network connectivity, so on and so forth, that this uh, uh, administrative tool or business application requires access to and deny all other things. And that's really core to the zero trust model. Right. But it, it's interesting on Linux, um, it, a highly skilled Linux person can do a lot, even just with one small subset of commands or binaries or files, right? Like living, I think that's why we don't see a lot of different strains of Linux malware most of what you need to do your evil bidding on Linux is already there. Yeah. Give me Netcat. Yeah. And I'll and, a, right? Okay. There's like, I remember in SANS classes, you know, 15 plus years ago, like we'd spend a lot of time on Netcat because you can pretty much do the, the, anything you need to do from an attacker perspective, certainly. Yeah. with. It. I mean, take it one step further. Um, most Linux environments use some number of Python scripts for core administrative tasks. Um, it, there's a reason that Python is the number one uh, programming language in the recent 
let's say five years. I don't remember the exact stats, but it is it is really surpassing everything else. And to run an, a, a Linux script, you obviously need, uh, or a, a Python script, you need the Python binary. Um, well, I can use the Python binary interactively to do any manner of action. Anything that I can type into that CLI, I can make it do. And so you can't take away Python. Uh, and right. by leaving Python, you leave a massive opening, a big gap for uh, uh, attackers to exploit. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see you give give Joff just the Python binary on a system and try and prevent him from doing evil things. That would be a great yeah, like live exercise, really Joff, and you would win every time. I, I, I would put my money on you every time. Yeah, so people try to put uh, controls around these things using SE Linux, and SE Linux could specify a set of controlled access for Python local to the box, but even SE Linux can't put that same uh, uh, context around a single script. It couldn't differentiate the file accesses for foo.py versus bar.py. Um, one of the advantages of the zero trust model with Edgewise is we can actually differentiate access controls mm -hmm. uh, for individual scripts or the interactive command line. Right. So, uh, sorry, Joff, I think your mic was muted. Did you? Oh, oh, I was just going to say, I, I think it's um, uh, what I'm hearing uh, Pete say, it's, it's kind of a matter of where you're focused, right? Uh, you look at SE Linux, it's very focused on granular controls. It's very focused on individual files, devices, that kind of stuff. Um, whereas um, you have almost an orthogonal uh, uh, focus to that, where you're looking at it from, you know, the individual scripts that are running and, you know, what their, their sort of universal rights are when they run is, 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 I think, what I'm hearing, which makes more sense in an overall security control context. Um, I think SE Linux is, is really more focused on operating system hardening than anything else. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you've mm. hit the nail on the head. Um, what we focus on is that for malicious software, um, generally you have to have a communication path. I mean, there are exceptions like Stuxnet, where you could sort of jump an air gap through, you know, installing on devices that get passed through the air gap. But the fact of the matter is, most malware needs some sort of command and control. It needs some mechanism to exfiltrate data. It needs some uh, mechanism to communicate. And what Edgewise does is gives you very granular yet automated control over exactly how software interacts via sockets. So, uh, Peter, you were uh, experimenting with some Linux malware. It sounds really bad when I say it that way for some reason. Like you're a mad <laughs> scientist or, or something of the like, but... You know, I, I think like a lot of uh, researchers, and I, I don't claim to be a researcher, I, I'm really not. I just, uh, I needed to pretend to be one in this particular case. Um, there's always a, a quest to get uh, recent malware. And so I started searching around and I, I found this site that's uh, pretty much a, a procured list of known malware for Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and virtually any mobile device, stuff like that. Um, I'll actually share my screen because uh, uh, it's, it's sure. better to see this stuff than to have me yammer on about it. So this is the site I found, and it's, it's maintained by this person who um, is, a, is a researcher. Uh, she's been working in uh, uh, threat research for, for quite some time, and she really just inventories all of the available malware and makes it available through this uh, nice little box uh, a list of, of malware. So I was looking through this list and I was like, well, I got to find one of these things. And, and I had read an article from an, another vendor that I'm not really familiar with, but the, the article was very interesting about Hidden Wasp. And one of the really interesting things about Hidden Wasp is it's a rootkit that does not require root access to the kernel. Um, it installs as a shim in user land, yet undermines all of the core operating system capabilities. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe she has hidden wasps. So I, uh, I was searching through that box account, and guess what I stumbled across? Uh, hidden wasps. So I downloaded it, uh, contacted her, and said, you know what? The file's um, password protected. What do I do? And so she gave me the, the magic password, which I am not going to share with anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want the password, 
you have to contact her directly from that website. Um, so what we're going to do is um, I already transferred Hidden Wasp onto this box. Um, we're, we're just going to expand it. So we'll do an unzip on uh, this Hidden Wasp sample. It's going to prompt me for the password. Again, I'm not going to share it right now. Hopefully, I can actually even remember it. Uh, yes, I remembered. Uh, so let's see. We've got a bunch of these files. Uh, these are the exact same files that Hidden Wasp is made up of. The only difference that she uh, implements into this is she prefixes the hash value of the file in front of it. Um, and otherwise, we can just execute these no problem. So we need to give it permissions. Obviously, these don't yet have any executable permissions. So let's just do a chmod um, plus execute on, let's just do it on all of them because I am being lazy. Um, great. So the first one that you execute to install Hidden Wasp is this file right here. I believe it was... Um, 8E. Yes. Excellent. And so uh, before I do this, because you know I, I want to be pretty careful about this sort of stuff, uh, this is one of my internal systems that I use all the time for uh, demoing and testing. The last thing I want is to forget to turn the protection on and have it ravage this environment, and then I don't have a demo environment for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to go in here. I've got a PCI segment that I'm going to unleash this into, and um, which seems like a really terrible idea, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, but so, it's compliant, so it must be secure, Peter. So oh, it's okay. yes, it's compliant uh, it, exactly. So it's <laughs> definitely secure. Uh, so we're going to go into the policies, and we're just going to take a quick look. Um, we've got a set of default protections on this. Uh, right now, what you can see is inbound perimeter for the host segment, uh, PCI, which contains three devices, including the LinUser DB01 <laughs> device that we're going to unleash this thing on. Uh, I've disabled all of the simulated blocks, which is the reason I came in here. I wanted to make sure that simulation was disabled. So these are real legitimate blocks. And I'm going to block all inbound, outbound, and internal. This is key. So in the world of Edgewise, we we uh, uh, enforce the default block action on all communications between every device in this host segment and between every piece of software running within the devices. It's literally every connection. It could be over loopback. It could be over IPv6 loopback. It could be distributed between them using any protocol, any IP stack. It doesn't matter. Those are going to be verified based on software identity. What I've done here is I've said... Does, yeah. Does that does that include like a name pipe and like your IPC connections and stuff? It, it does not use name piped or uh, any sort of uh, uh, I, uh, uh, any sort of interprocess communication that uses semaphores or something like that. Basically, if your software requests a socket, we control it. It doesn't matter how it communicates or within which uh, sort of device or between devices it communicates, we control it. So now that I know that this is the case, uh, just quickly, there's override policies. So you set some default actions on the host segment, and then you override them saying PCI segment internal. This is a list of software that should be able to communicate internal to the segment. This is a list of software that should be allowed to communicate outbound to uh, unmanaged addresses, meaning addresses that are not controlled by Edgewise. This is a list of software that should be able to receive inbound connections from other Edgewise managed devices. This is a list of software that should be able to make outbound connections to other managed software, so for Linux authentication. So that's the entire policy set governing all communications 100% for the entire PCI segment. And so, so Peter, to, to Tyler's point as well, uh, when an attacker compromises a box and it's got edgewise on it, 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 if they're trying to do something that's not in the, the policy, I can't leave that box. I can do a lot of stuff on that box between processes, but once I hit the network stack in any capacity, I can't leave unless I'm all can't leave. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how, how you try to obfuscate what you're doing, you just can't leave. Gotcha. So, in a previous episode, we went through like using a Python yeah, interactive yeah, I remember terminal. That. Right. Yeah, that that couldn't 
you you cannot obfuscate what you're doing enough to make it so uh, we can't control it. So enough with this. Let's actually do something. I'm going to hit enter on this. And, you know, it's, it's not dramatic. It just says, sorry, permission denied right there. So the permission denied on this is coming. And, and what we can see is now in monitor, uh, if we do a target on enforcement type enforcement and we say uh, user, oh, it's already at the top of the list. So I didn't. And, and basically, that that script was essentially is. trying to There's phone home Peter. Is that is that essentially what it was? Yeah, trying it's to do? trying to contact the command and control systems. Sure. And so when I was dissecting what Hidden Wasp does, all of these things are littered with outbound communications. It's not just to contact the phone home. It's to uh, download the appropriate version of of modules and shared objects and stuff like that. It's trying to load up the system with all of the appropriate things and then phone home to get, uh, you know, actions that it's supposed to perform. And that's the real point here is that the majority of malware needs some form of communication to perform its malicious action. And by wrapping it in this very tight protection of allowed software is allowed to communicate, everything else is blocked, you effectively disrupt the software from ever even performing its design function. Can, so can that, that's the can that of, malware jump into another process and then make that communication, Peter? Or like how far back in the chain does does it check? Here's the here's the key. Um, the software that has allowed communication paths has very specific allowed communication paths. So let's pretend like uh, there was some vulnerability where the software could inject itself into some other process. Right. Very common. Sure. Um, and it, it wasn't something that we could detect. Mm -hmm. It, for instance, it wasn't like you were attaching a debugger. Yeah, sure. We would see a debugger mm. attached and invalidate the identity so that it couldn't do things gotcha. that were bad. Yep. Um, let's say there was some technique that we just weren't aware of. Um, well, what access would the attacker actually have? They would only have access to the access that that specific process is allowed to interact with and nothing more. Hmm. Interesting. And by the way, that access would not include the ability to contact the command and control system. Right. Yeah, it draws a, a very distinct sandbox around everything on the system. May, I mean, very distinct sandbox, and, yep. and nothing's impossible, but it certainly makes it really hard for an attacker not to trigger some kind of alarm to try and accomplish what exactly. they're accomplishing. Exactly. And that's what exactly. I like about defensive uh, uh, techniques and software is it, you can't stop 100% of everything, right? But if you've made it so difficult and tedious for the attacker to move around, that eventually they're just going to step out of the bounds and you're going to detect them somehow, right? I think that's yep. really where it's at. That's precisely it. And so had this malware managed to phone home, I'm sure it would do other things that... It would do other things. Uh, so what I've done is incrementally allowed each step of that process through. Mm. And ultimately, it hits yet another one. It hits yet another one until the software gets deployed. And guess what it does? It tries to phone home again. So the, the point is that every single one of those scripts, every single one of those executables, every library it downloaded, every one of those things is involved in some form of communication. The, the only form of sort of subversive activity I could see that could have a chance of, circ of circumventing the control is if you injected into like a DNS process or something like that, and you were somehow able to encode all of your transmissions mm -hmm. into the DNS process by injecting into the process that got into the network stack of the DNS process. You see what I'm, I'm yeah. getting at? Yeah, so that would be difficult to detect. I mean, unless you're analyzing your DNS traffic, and then you know, one one of your um, one of your uh, uh, other companies that that you work with, uh, I recall they were slurping in the Microsoft DNS query logs and doing analytics on that to mm -hmm. understand when the volume of DNS queries exceeded the baseline of normal or was going sort of off the reservation in terms of the types of DNS queries that that were typical for given applications and hosts. And the point is, this is really, that, that sort of identification is the land of EDR and SIMS with uh, you know, uh, 
relatively relatively simple analytics picked on top of it. Yeah, uh, extra hop is probably what you're referring to. Hey, hey you know what? Not. I don't really call the the company. Even if it is, everybody is bent on putting DNS over HTTPS, which drives me crazy. No! There it is. I, I, I love it. It's like a pull in the string on the... No, don't <laughs> fucking do that. <laughs> don't buy the whole thing anyway. Uh, oh. You know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll wait. You know, this. mentioning I'll DNS wait. was not a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's never a mistake. So, Peter, earlier you said that this particular malware, Hidden Wasp, doesn't require root-level privileges, doesn't oh. require insertion into the kernel? Is that true? No, but that's, is still that's what's cool about it. able to persist and do... do uh, can you elaborate on what, what you know about how this yeah, malware... Yeah, so they, uh, they replace the LD loader and then they uh, have a shared objects that get loaded into any new process so that they can... Uh, take action in the context of another process. And so it, it strikes to the core of your point, which is, okay, great, you get the uh, module loaded, and now a new process instantiates. And this is kind of important that um, all existing loaded processes, just because you take over the loader function, mm -hmm. the old processes that are already running would not actually have that library loaded into it. And That's you, don't, you don't need to be root to take over the loader process because it... Okay, well, yeah. there's there's sort of the rub, is that to, to replace... Oh, yeah. It's relying on the fact that you either have root or you have poor permissioning that yeah. would give you the ability to change the files to load your shared object uh, at invocation time of another process. So, I mean, there is some... Sure. There is some elevated privilege that's needed or a administrative snafu. And, and we all know everyone has 100% of their file permissions correct on every single Linux instance, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. And all of the permissions sit on every Docker container. In the Docker container as well. That's okay. Kubernetes will solve all this. We're good. It's, you know, it's the future. Or, or the let future. the attacker deploy, deploy this malware at scale inside every single container. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so think about even worms, right? Yeah. propagating over SSH through, you know, tunneling or some other mechanism, those all require communication paths. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a communication path that is redirecting your traffic through SSH client so that it can forward onto another system. That is communication that is governed by right. the Edgewise Zero Trust Access Control. Really? That's okay. Point, we get we're going to put everything over TLS and nobody will know what the fuck's going on anyway. And so all our security solutions are going to be foobod. You know, like DNS. That's a really, it's a really good point. TLS 1.5 really uh, causes problems for men in the middle. The, the, okay. good, the good kind of men in the middle for, you know, deep packet inspection and otherwise. Right. And I think that, that really highlights, uh, not to make it all about me, but... Uh, for edgewise, shifting your focus instead of the traffic that was passing, instead, what started the traffic and what received the traffic, if you can identify the core processes and the soft and, and the devices that initiated and received the processes, then as long as you've got high integrity and strong identity verification of both of those things, then what they're saying back and forth is a little less important. And Peter, speaking of containers, communication between containers, even though they're running on the same host and independent of largely really any config, still hits the network stack and allows Edgewise oh, yeah. to manage oh, that, this is, right? This is really interesting, actually. Um, so from the vantage point of the operating system, every containerized process is just a PID with a... Um, with an identifier that gives it gives it a context relative to the container. Well, from the socket perspective, all of those socket requests also are viewed as you know going to the kernel mm -hmm. with a little identifier that says, oh, but this socket request came from container XYZ. Mm -hmm. So when we see that, what we see is a lot of overlapping IP space. Uh, because a lot of them will communicate over link, uh, uh, loopback interfaces mm -hmm. or use overlapping RFC 1918 address space. So let's say you've got a Kubernetes cluster talking to another Kubernetes cluster. The communications within those containers may have actually overlapping IP space. Right. And so how exactly could you firewall your way into solving this problem? Mm. They've got 
inconsistent IP space. That's why identity is so important is because if you can apply identity between this containerized process and this containerized process in different containers, the same container, containers running in the same cluster or different clusters, by assigning the policy between this identity and this identity, the details of how the network worked right. or how the overlapping IP space worked or how the DNATs worked that mapped it to non-conflicting IP space, right. all of those details go away because all you're saying is that foo.jar is able to talk to bar.jar. And as long as it's those two pieces of software, they're allowed to communicate. It's, it's interesting that they, uh, you know, with virtual machines and containers that they decided to use the networking stack rather than direct kind of process communications as ultimately still in the same host. Was that so we could add filters or so that we could have something that we could understand that this IP address talks to this IP address, even though they're still in the same host? You know, I... Uh, legitimately, I, I hadn't thought of this before. But I hadn't like, either until oh. I just verbalized it. <laughs> I was like, that's really, in fact, on Tyler's question, like, that's a really interesting question. Like, all this stuff, even though it's in the same host, in, in containers, talking in containers, it's going over the network. Yeah. My sort of knee jerk reaction is well, first of all, it was probably just easier. Uh, yeah, but yeah. second, uh, this concept of a sidecar and the ability to force traffic through an intermediate container um, for network fil filtering and stuff like that. Um, that is probably one of the main motivations so that you could have a sidecar and force all of that traffic through some ingress egress point that is intermediated by some appliance like thing, AKA a sidecar mm -hmm. um, to do filtering and any other manner of, right. of uh, access control. It, it, but that, you know, it makes I'm me sure beg. There are the, other reasons. <laughs> yeah, well, then it makes me beg the question: How you handle all their Docker resources, like volumes, which don't mm -hmm. they don't get IP addresses, right? So they do have some type of communication between them, independent of that. It is a in, a really interesting point. It, just getting into the sort of the weeds of the um, Edgewise implementation and sort of the process of of building this this pretty unique solution. Um, the the one unique challenge with containers is that we need a fingerprint of software and dependencies, so on and so forth. And that software and dependencies lives within the context of the volume of the container image, right? not of the um, uh, container host itself mm -hmm. and the file systems that support it. Um, so we actually have to peer into the file system of the image mm -hmm. to understand what is the process and all of the dependencies that were loaded into memory, because that was actually loaded from the file system of the image. Um, and that, that was, that was a little tricky, I bet. Uh, but no, obviously we figured it out. That's awesome. I like asking theoretical or not even theoretical questions like that because sometimes people write in with the answers, <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know, design oh, container I'm, system. I'm sure there's somebody listening that knows right. exactly why it was done that way. Right. But, right. You, know, you know, it strikes me as you guys were talking about that that there is still this desire uh, that that exists in some, not all, uh, to stick to kind of standardization, right? And the IP stack is very much a standard way of communicating, uh, right? And has been You're for right, a while. Yeah. Um, and so it, it also opens the, um, a, a, as Peter was saying, it, it opens up the playing field for others to play in terms of inter intermediaries. Uh, boy, I can't say that word when I have bourbon on board. Anyway, <laughs> um, it opens up the playing field there, um, in terms of being in the middle of that communication. So uh, it, it is interesting question you pose though, Paul, because communication is communication. You can frame it in any stack. You can, right. you know, bytes are bytes. Uh, you, you, they could have easily made the cho choice to uh, go down the, the road of some sort of proprietary protocol. But I think the, uh, to use another word I'm going to struggle with after one martini, interoperability uh, of software in general using TCP IP makes it accessible to more software packages. They don't have to know how to communicate in any other way. They just need to know how to talk to TCP IP. Cool. That's pretty easy, especially, you know, in really any operating system. Kind of brings up a tangential question to me, and that is, 
why why continue to propagate IPv4 when you have an opportunity in virtualization to just say screw it we're going to use a v6 stack if we're going to stick to standardization we'll just go forward looking from here mm. um, but uh, anyway I, I, I suppose I that challenge a... would would give you uh, v4 to v6 translation uh, translation issues or should I say vice versa but... it is kind of interesting that Windows by default, um, you get an IPv6 and IPv4 address, and if it can communicate over IPv6, it it will use that communication. So if you're on the same broadcast domain as the thing you're trying to communicate with, it's going to go over IPv6. And Linux will and, try and do that as well because uh, I've actually run into a ton of distribution. Well? Yeah, I have run into a ton of issues where like stuff just won't start and it's because it's only listen well it'll start but it'll only listen on IPv6 yeah. not IPv4 and I have to like reach into the internals the, uh, and c CTL and all that stuff and to say no I need IPv4 not v6 That's one of the things that I've noticed recently uh you start Apache Yes. And then you do a netstat, and it says it's listening on IPv6. Not v4. A, and not v4, but it is listening on IPv4 because you can hit it on IPv4. Right. So I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a generalized trend here, though, um, that, that kind of speaks to what, what, uh, you know, what, what Edgewise is going for. And I'm not going to give you a free promotion here, but I, I think it's um, uh, it, it really is uh, this idea that, that, that uh, network communications has become so volatile. Mm. everybody's just assuming it away. I mean, it just happens. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that people generally just don't think about it. It's just like, this thing is happening. I don't care whether it's V6, V4, V4, or I don't care what the protocol is, as long as point A talks to point B. Yeah. It gives you a lot of flexibility as well. Even though today you think that you don't need to use IP for communication, um, who knows what tomorrow is? And so developers trying to be as flexible as possible will will use that. And by the way, the um, the the thing you pointed out about IPv4 and IPv6 um, was a, a little factoid. Uh, so the sockets that a piece of software interacts with, there's um, there's socket options for dual mode sockets or yep. for single. Um, so you can actually select whether or not you want it to be a compatible socket for IPv6 and IPv4, or whether you just want it to be IPv4 or just want it to be IPv6. So I, I didn't know that developers had made this switch, but uh, it sounds to me like whatever software you were using was defaulting to using an IPv6 uh, socket instead of a dual mm -hmm. uh, socket. But that that brings up interesting issues when you're trying to limit monitor and or control communications between applications that are using IP and we've seen this a, you know a million times since we first started seeing IPv6 IPv4 is great we're doing all kinds of filtering but IPv6 is a, a wide open playing field uh, and it sounds like Peter that your software will will recognize that and say, "Whoa, oh, yeah. communications, communication doesn't matter if it's V4 or V6," which it helps uh, us out as blue teamers to go give us some peace of mind that yes, if we're trying to control yeah. where this software can go and what can talk to what, that we're we're covering these different options. Yeah, that's exactly it. We we deal in the world of uh, this this term that we coined um, application paths instead of network paths. And the simple way to think about it is a network path, as, as you're well aware, is a source address to a destination address plus a port plus a protocol. And that could be an IPv4 or an IPv6. Now, an application path is simply a path between a piece of software running on a device and another piece of software running on another device. And when you deal in the world of application paths and apply policy to application paths, what you are implicitly saying is, I don't care what the network paths are that connect these application paths. I am managing the end-to-end -end connectivity mm -hmm. between two pieces of software running on two devices. So sure, it could be IPv6, it could be IPv4, it could be link local, it could be RFC 1918, it could be globally routable, it could be anything as long as the app path is covered, it doesn't matter what the communication path is. That is also protected implicitly. So this is similar to kind of what they were striving for for 
uh, software defined networking, right? With something like NSX at the at the virtual layer, uh, you're you're really taking very specific uh, hypervisor or very specific applications, and you're looking at layer seven, uh, and then anything below that is is based on rules and filters that that layer seven is doing. So you've essentially so simplified. This is, this is really interesting, and it it might surprise you. Um, we do not look at layer seven at all not even a little bit. In fact, we try to take ourselves out of the communication path as soon as possible so that we don't need to intermediate high bandwidth applications, which would, of course, consume lots of resources. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're actually looking at is a cryptographic fingerprint of the software on both sides of the connection, as well as the device, and then verifying the end-to-end -end uh, software identity to make sure that it's actually legitimately what's supposed to be communicating. And so layer seven is still protocol. That's still saying, what is the application layer protocol that is used to establish communication? What we're looking at is one step further out. What is the actual binaries that are interacting and what is the fingerprint of the software? And if you'll, if you'll bear with me for two seconds, I actually, um, since you've never seen this before, let me just show you very, very quickly. And I don't want to share. That, gonna... that, that could describe Paul on so many levels. Okay. I'm going to drop. Before. I'm going to drop in a, a, a really quick comment in between while you're Go ahead, preparing. John. I think uh, this discussion actually illustrates why the attack path, uh, the attack surface, if you like, has really uh, moved to being the control plane uh, of all of these software entities. Uh, rather than uh, necessarily purely or exclusively the applications themselves, because the control plane is is new, being developed. It's it's you know in in everything we're doing, the control plane is is necessarily a ability point. Um, so it it becomes especially and, and I'm really uh, uh, tying into the software defined networking, and it also ties into uh, control plane virtualization software as well. Not to get too far off task, but the control plane is everything now, and it, it means a, he a heck of a lot. It's not a physical entity anymore, and uh, that, that's certainly an attack surface for you all. Well, yeah, it, it's interesting, Joff, that uh, oftentimes we fight that losing battle in the application layer of, of trying to apply controls to things, right? Where, Peter, I really like what your, your, your approach that you know, binaries and their communication paths are really the lowest common denominator that we need to control in order to apply trust. Yeah. And it, it's almost frustrating to me that so many people look at zero trust as a buzzword where if you listen to this conversation, you <laughs> realize that there's a lot to be gained from a security perspective from, from the approach. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, the, the thing I wanted to show you was um, this idea of an application path. This is a really interesting one because this application path, is Firefox on desktop one talking to itself on desktop one using the loopback. It's not even doing IPC to itself. Hmm. It's actually using the network to communicate amongst the same binary. Um, that's un so that's not unusual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it strikes to the, to the point that uh, a bunch of people were making earlier that it's a convenience factor, yeah. even though you've got semaphores, even though you've got uh, you know Berkeley sockets, you've got a lot of facilities for doing high performance local communication. Developers are opting to use a network even to communicate internally. Hmm. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you was um, this idea of identity. So what you can see here is these identity properties. And you'll note that there's actually two distinct Firefoxes plus this little stack icon. And really the idea here is that uh, people upgrade software and they can't be bothered to change policies just because software changed. And so one of our patents is actually covering the ability to take two different pieces of software. You can see this one here starts with the SHA-256 CB, uh, C8B1 and this one down here is CA5B. And we intelligently map these together understanding that it's actually the same binary, just a different version. So that as you apply a policy to these things, you don't need to change the policy just because you upgraded the software. Um, and that just 
dramatically simplifies the process and makes sure that you've got a consistent view of what an app path is. You don't need to view the app paths for this version of Firefox versus this version. You view it as Firefox and you view the combined app paths so that it dramatically simplifies the management of it. And you say simplifies the management of it, but in the background, again, another buzzword that uh, hopefully we're all coming around to, it's, it's artificial intelligence that's helping you make those decisions to say, hey, that version of Firefox, Firefox is the same as this version of Firefox because there's 28 characteristics that you're putting through mm. an algorithm. I'm going to go out on a limb and start a battle. It's ML. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Not AI. It well, and AI. some people will no, say no. that, and some people will say that ML is a, a component of AI. No, no, no. I, I know it's just sure. such a hotly contested discussion. I, it I had is, to raise right? it because sometimes see how I will, responds. and it's funny. Sometimes I will call it ML, and then sometimes I will call it based on what kind of feedback I've gotten to, you know, what 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 is what is ML a component of AI? Is AI an overarching uh, term? No, what right. Is, why why don't we draw it into what it really is. I know a lot of vendors are not willing to say this, but there's neural networks and there is statistical based uh, classification yeah. systems. Yeah. And statistical based ca uh, classification systems for the most part tend to uh, boil down to using uh, random decision trees or random decision forests and averaging out those decisions based on uh, modeling and classification uh, criteria that you define. And, and, and this approach actually is pretty, pretty common. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure about neural networks. They're not probably as common. But when you say machine learning, uh, Peter, I think you're really referring to st uh, the uh, statistical uh, models that we use with uh, things like random job. decision trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What one hundred percent? I've I've had many conversations with our chief data scientist, who's a brilliant PhD from uh, Harvard and just just really stunning stunning intelligence and that's really what it boils down to is um bayesian analysis is probabilistic modeling statistics yep. um and that is typically what people mean when they refer to machine learning and that's when they refer to artificial intelligence it's about neural networks hmm. um exactly. and for the case of edgewise we specifically use bayesian analysis because um, if you've ever tried to look inside a neural network and understand why it makes decisions it makes, that's incredibly difficult. And one of the things that we strive to do is to help the user understand why we made a decision. And having a probabilistic analysis, a statistical model, um, makes it a lot easier to say the reason this decision was made is because based on the spectrum of outcomes, it falls within this this set limit that uh, that we we consider to be acceptable. Therefore, it was included. Uh, it's yeah. it's explainable why an outcome happens. Hmm. Exactly, exactly. It's it's actually a really critical point, and that's really where machine learning is at, right? Bayesian analysis, uh, random decision tree, random decision forest, stochastic uh, models. Um, you know, the, the, um, things like uh, probabilistic uh, equations um, over time. I mean, the bourbon's talking now. But uh, that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware of machine learning algorithms and I have engaged in, in writing them myself. So I know where you're at and they are predictable and you have a specific outcome that you can explain. Uh, whereas when people are using neural networks, um, they are absolutely in a world where they 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 train this uh, software animal and let it loose and and they honestly don't know where it's going to go. They they cannot really put a chain on it. Um, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this is the uh, paranoia rise of the machines discussion when you right, get on. Yeah. The, well, uh, the, but that's a different yeah, yeah, issue. And it, a lot of the algorithms in tech, not so much technology, but the algorithms are not new, right? The application no, not. the application and some of the evolution of them being applied to security in this context might are, are new but many of the algorithms that you folks are talking about are, are not new right these are things that even in suffice it to say uh, you know 60s 70s right at mit and other institutions they were developing these algorithms right the, the models have been around forever mm. uh yeah, jumping in there i'll let peter talk again in a minute but um, the models have been around forever. What's new, what has changed, 
is the sheer amount of data that can be processed and the computational power. Yeah, you're no, that's a great be. point, Joe. I yeah. could not that's agree more. Yeah, could not agree more. That's exactly it. Um, when you're dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands of events per second, each one of those requiring analysis, what you're saying is you either have to limit the window of time within which you do the analysis, meaning you've got a year's worth of data, but that year's worth of data represents an unimaginably complex set of, of interactions that need to be processed, or you need to shrink the data. And that's typically what we've done in these sorts of scenarios. But now uh, we spin up an EMR cluster and crunch through literally every shred of data you have in a couple hours. That's, yeah. that's what we're doing behind the scenes in the ML model. Um, it's just so efficient. You can throw AWS dollars uh, at the problem and all of a sudden your computational time decreases. Now, granted, there are certain algorithms that don't have the properties to, to scale uh, uh, linearly like that. Um, but, you know, most of the work that we do, uh, we do through these massive computational models in EMR clusters, and we sort of schedule it out. We take all of the data we have to the environment and crunch through it. It produces this model, and then we have it derive the policy sets from the model. It, it's amazing. I'm, I'm just speaking of some of these algorithms, I, and I happen to be listening to the book by Stephen Levy, uh, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. I don't know if you've read that one. It's an older book, um, but it talks about the, basically the origins of computing and how they were hackers. And there were folks working on AI and machine learning. The machines they had at the time, no, to hear them describe how they <laughs> programmed and interacted with those machines. And then when we think about today and talk about today's modern computing environment and realize how drastically different that is, it certainly speaks to Joff's earlier comment about how uh, these algorithms have been around for some time, but the computing power that we have today, even from 60, 70 years ago, is just drastically uh, different. It really makes you appreciate. I think a lot of us and a lot of folks listening to the show today carry a computer uh, in your pocket all day long and mm -hmm. every day. That, had more, that has more processing power than put us on the moon. And it's <clears throat> and it, 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 even before that, right, and it's so fascinating to listen to this book and ha listen to how the folks at MIT that were some of the first hackers, right, ha had to go for an hour's worth of time on a computer and would sign up at 3 in the morning. But then if someone else was signed up at 3 in the morning, they would wait around, play cards and other games. And if it was 3 or 1 and that person didn't show up, they took their hour's worth of computer time, right? Uh, it's just really, exactly. it's really cool to hear you, you know, we, us discuss some of these algorithms and how long they've been around and how much the technology has evolved. This is, you know, to, in my opinion, this is actually the true success of the cloud. Forget forget outsourcing yeah, yeah. your AD and, and you know, like doing your routine computing. No, the ability to apply scale to real machine learning algorithms, this is where the cloud succeeds. This is where it's at. Um, and uh, this applies not only to commercial so solutions, it applies way beyond that. I mean, there there is, um, I hope, I've got a lot of faculty friends in universities, I hope a lot of faculty are reaching out and leveraging these resources for their research right. uh, purposes because it it you just don't have that kind of resource anywhere else, right? It's the natural consolidation of of an enormous amount of power um, and that can be leveraged for an incredible amount of uh, productivity. Right, and I you know, and I'll, Edgewise is a sponsor, right? But to see this technology now coming full circle and apply it to the techniques we talked about. Uh, is a great yeah. tool in our arsenal, right? It's funny. Yeah. I was I was doing a, a panel last night, and um, one of the questions was, uh, "Why is why is zero trust uh, even possible now? Like, why is it mm. so important?" And um, one of the reasons I think is because to accomplish least privilege access, you either have to have started with a default deny and over time built up a least privileged policy set. And that's that's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Most organizations didn't. Uh, they're brownfield environments with wide open networks that allow most communications to just happen. So how in the world can you achieve 
a least privilege default deny outcome when you don't even understand what's interacting and communicating. And my point to the group was simply to say that one of the reasons that least privilege is even possible today in brownfield environments is because of the computational power and the analytics sort of prowess that we've built up over the past many decades coming together at exactly the same time to take massive mountains of data and crunching it down to meaningful uh, results that can right. be actionable. That, that's never been possible before, and it's making it feasible to achieve better security outcomes as a result. Absolutely. Agree. It's, it's also solving a problem that we've all bemoaned several times, and that is the human being, the talented human being, there's only a limited amount of them, and you can only scale the human being so far. Uh, so to build these ML models and to be able to scale up solutions that actually solve a massive problem without having to plug in a lot of humans uh, is uh, absolutely required right now. You mm -hmm. just There's not enough of us to actually plug into to some of these problems. So it, it's... Uh, yep. We, we now, tried that, to do the ML models using AWS Mechanical Turk, but that didn't, that didn't really work out in the end. <laughs> bunch of people scribbling down <laughs> uh we're almost done we're almost done <laughs> I, I i i almost want to shove them inside of a trojan horse as well you know so they could <laughs> kind of spill out with their you know with their scratch pads in hand you know <laughs> uh, so uh, peter it's uh securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise um and there is some we talked about demo capabilities and people requesting uh trials oh yeah uh, in yeah the past. yeah yeah, if you if you want to try out Edgewise uh, in Q4 and use it in a Linux environment for uh, real real lockdown of your your sort of environment, prevent malware propagation, uh, insider abuse stuff like that, um, just go to our website and uh, in the top right corner of the screen, what you're going to see is a uh, give it a try button. Click that and let them know that you saw us on Paul Security Weekly, and we will give you a big old discount. There you go. Peter, thank you so much for oh, my coming for back to me. I, I love having a conversation. They're so nerdy and uh, engaging. Uh, I just, I love it. And I hope our, I, I'm sure our audience feels the same. Anytime I'm like, wow, that was a really nerdy and engaging. And uh, I learned a lot from that conversation. I know our audience is probably having a pretty similar experience. So Peter, again, cool. I, thank I you love so being, much. So thanks a lot. Uh, with that, we'll take a short break and come back with uh, Kevin and Josh and talk about arcade hacking. So stay tuned.